to turn your Bibles to 1 John. Can you do that real quick? 1 John chapter 4. Because the Bible writers, even they themselves, began to see this taking place. 1 John chapter 4. All right? This is very, very interesting. 1 John chapter 4. Look at verse 3, what John wrote about this. Even back in his time, it says in 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of who, folks? The Antichrist. We have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. John was saying, listen, you've heard that this spirit of Antichrist is going to come and so on. But he says, I want you to know it's already working. He couldn't put his finger on it quite, but it was beginning to form already in his day. But folks, as you see what you see on the screen, these kind of statements, Paul did warn us about it specifically. I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians now. We're going to continue on the slides in just a moment. Chapter 14, as we begin this exciting study together. Revelation chapter 14. For those of you that may be new tonight, we promised the audience last evening as we close that we would take just a couple of minutes to review what we covered last evening. And again, for those of you that are new, this is going to go very, very fast. I'm going to preach in about 10 minutes what took me over an hour last night, okay? And so it's going to come very, very quickly, but it's just a quick review. And if everything is not quite crystal clear, I do encourage you to go back and get lesson number three, or listen to tape number three, and that will cover it a little bit more thoroughly. Last night, we studied about the Antichrist kingdom. We read the warning in Revelation chapter 14 that God gives the world. And let's make that the beginning tonight again. Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10 now. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. As we studied that last night, we saw that that is the most serious warning that God in his love sends to the world in these last days. And he simply tells us if we worship this beast, if we worship the image of this beast, or if we receive the mark of this beast, God says we're going to simply be lost in the last days. So right away we got interested in this and we knew that God would not send such a serious warning message unless he also made this truth clear and simple and easy to understand. God is in the business of saving people. He's not trying to keep as many as he can out of heaven. He wants to get as many as he can into heaven. Isn't that right? And so we, we knew in his love when he sent a message like this, he also had to make it clear. So we began to break it down step by step and we began to ask, how do we correctly interpret prophecy? We went to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19 to 21. The Bible told us we could not privately interpret prophecy, but we had to let the scriptures interpret themselves. And that meant getting every scripture you could on the subject, putting them all together. And when you do that, then you know you got Bible truth. So following that rule, we got right into our study in Revelation chapter 13. And we read about this strange beast. It had a body of a leopard. It had the feet of a bear. In the first three verses, we read this. It had uh, ten horns and uh, you know, all these different heads and so on. And, and we couldn't figure out what it all meant. So step by step, we began to let the Bible interpret it. I'm going to see how well you all remember as we go through it. The first thing we saw was that the beast came up from the waters or the sea. Do you all remember what the waters and the sea symbolized? Very good. Multitudes of people that spoke different languages. Very, very good. You're a very sharp crowd. So when it comes up out of the sea, we read in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, that uh, the sea represented the multitudes of people. So that gave us a good clue right there. And then looking at all these other parts, the body of the leopard, the feet of the bear, the heads of the lion, the ten horns, we couldn't figure out where all those things came from or what they meant. So we had to leave the book of Revelation and we went to what book? Very good, the book of Daniel. That is the companion book that always interprets the book of Revelation. And as we went back to the book of Daniel, we saw there that Daniel was having another interesting vision or dream. And in that dream, he saw four great beasts come up out of the sea. And we got interested in this. What exactly is a beast? What does a beast symbolize? Because we knew a beast that God told us not to worship. That was one thing. Now we got these four other beasts. And we read in verse 17 and verse 23 of Daniel 7 that a beast represents a what? Very good, a king and his kingdom. And we had four of them come up. The first one was the lion with eagle's wings, and obviously what kingdom was that? That was Babylon, yeah. The second one that came up was the bear with three ribs in his mouth, and what kingdom was that? Medo-Persia, all right, we're just going through a succession of history. After Medo-Persia, we had the leopard-like beast with four wings and four heads, and what kingdom was that? Greece, very good. The last one was the dreadful and terrible beast, very strong, it had ten horns, and that was the fourth and final kingdom of... Rome. Very, very good. As we went through that study, then we learned a little bit more. We saw that this fourth beast over here 
also had ten horns. And we wondered, what do those ten horns represent? We went right into Daniel chapter 7, verse 23 and 24, and the Bible told us that the ten horns were ten kingdoms that would arise out of this Roman Empire when it fell. And sure enough, we study that when Rome fell in 476, it divided into exactly ten kingdoms, making up many of the Western European nations today. These are the original ten divisions of the Roman Empire. Uh, the countries that uh, conquered it were the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Alamanni, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Hurli, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Suevi, and the Vandals. And as we studied that, that was amazing in itself. But then we went farther to find out that three of those countries no longer exist. And the reason was this. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, there was a, all of a sudden a little horn or another little kingdom that popped up. Remember that? And as that little kingdom popped up among the other ten kingdoms here, we got very interested in this new little kingdom in Daniel 7, verse 8. And we wanted to find out who it was. And so the Bible then gave us ten ways that we could identify this little kingdom, you remember. First of all, the Bible said it would come up among the other ten kingdoms. We also found out it would come up after 476 A.D. This was all in Daniel chapter 7. We found out it would be a little horn or a little kingdom, the smallest one over there. We found it would uproot or destroy three other horns or kingdoms, which was the Hurrieli, Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. By the way, I had someone come in tonight and they said, Leo, I went to my encyclopedia, and guess what? You were right on. That's exactly what the encyclopedia said. It's a matter of history. And so they were excited about that. Anyway, we found out it would have a man at its head, and that man would speak for the kingdom at all times. It was diverse or different than all the other European nations. It would speak great words and blasphemy. We went into that very deeply last night, what that meant. Number eight, it would wear out and war against God's saints. We looked at that very carefully. Number nine, it would think to change God's times and laws. And last of all, number 10, the Bible even told us how long it would rule for a total time period of 2,000 or excuse me, 1,260 days or 1,260 prophetic years. And after we went through all these 10 points, ladies and gentlemen, I did not even have to tell you what kingdom it was. Every single one of you were able to tell me just like that. And we found out it could apply to only one kingdom, and that was the kingdom of Papal Rome, or the Holy Roman Empire, the Vatican City. Now, let me say something for those that may be new here tonight, if I may. It's very important, and we stressed this last night, that in Bible prophecy, God never brings out things to hurt anybody or to offend anybody, but in His love, He brings out the history of this world in advance. And He tells us things that's going to happen, how it affects the Christian church and people and so on. And last night we made a very clear distinction, because God did, we made a distinction between the Catholic Church, which is one thing over here, and what God is talking about in His prophecy, the kingdom of Papal Rome. This kingdom, like all kingdoms, has done some things in the past that are not real good, just like America has and Germany has and many other countries. But that's the kingdom. Most kingdoms are corrupt because they're political or whatever. But the people of the Catholic Church are totally different than the kingdom. And as we talked last night, we wanted to be sure that no one that might be Catholic would be offended uh, by this prophecy and what God is bringing out here, because God loves all people. Can you say amen? And we talked last night that Catholics are some of the sweetest and the most devout and some of the most precious people that you'll ever meet that love God with all their hearts. And a number of you Catholics came to me last night and said that you really appreciated uh, how that was presented because you felt very comfortable and you felt right at home. And that's how we want it to be in this seminar. We're not here to bash Catholics. We're not here to bash Protestants. We're not here to talk in, uh, about and criticize each other. We're here to say, Jesus, we love you. This is your revelation. Jesus, you gave us this. This comes straight from God. And because you love us, Lord, we want to see that, and we just want to respond to the truth. We want the Bible to bring us together. And if we keep that attitude, we're going to be fine here night by night. Okay? So after we identified all that... Then we went back to Revelation 13. And when we went back to Revelation 13, we found something very, very interesting. We found out that the beast of Revelation 13 was exactly the same as the little horn we just studied in Daniel 7. And you're going to find something else interesting here. Notice on the screen, if you would, have you ever wondered what does the Vatican mean? Have you ever thought about that? Got into a word study this not long ago, and I found one of the most fascinating things in the world. Look up the word, the root word of the Vatican, which is the word Vatic. In your dictionary, the word Vatic means prophetic or oracular. Most people have never seen that. The very root word of the city itself means prophetic or oracular. Then when I was in Rome not long ago, I was looking at some of the money and just, just looking, they have different money, of course, the lira and so on. And as I was looking at it, I noticed something that just blew my mind. Look at this next picture. This is the 100 lira coin, very popular over there. This one was just minted in 1959. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see something here. It says, Sipta del Vaticano. You know what that means literally in English? City of 
prophecy. Isn't that awesome? Even papal Rome itself knows that it is the city of prophecy. Now there's something even more dramatic. Look at the picture. The picture is the woman with the golden cup in her hand. I'm not going to get into that tonight, but if you go and look in Revelation 17, you will see who that woman is. It's known as the great whore of Revelation chapter 17, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And they put it on their own coin with the words that say city of prophecy. Even they know that they are the city of prophecy. That just blew my mind when I saw that. I thought you'd find that very, very interesting. Anyway, let's continue on here. As I said, we went back to Revelation 13, and we saw this beast, and we noticed that everything the Bible described about this beast, it also described of the little horn in Daniel 7. And as we compare the notes, clearly God identified this beast as the Papal Roman Empire, or the Vatican City. And therefore, we concluded very simply that the power that God says don't worship, don't worship his image, and don't receive the mark from, was the kingdom of Papal Rome, okay? Now, that was all review. Now we're going to get into tonight's sermon, okay? And uh, we're going to really see some amazing things as we continue on here. We ended last night by asking some important questions. One of the questions was, where did the beast power get all of its power and authority, power to rule the world for 1260 years, power to put those millions of martyrs to death and so on. Who's behind the beast power? What, what, what's behind this? And the answer is found in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. Let's look at that for a minute. Revelation chapter 13 and now verse 2. I'll give you a chance to get in your Bibles now, just a few pages back from where you were. Revelation 13 verse 2. By the way, someone asked me, am I allowed to mark my Bible? The answer is yes. We want you to mark your Bibles. And we hope by the time you're done, your Bible's all marked up. Nothing wrong with that. It's your Bible to use night by night, so feel free to mark it. Here we go. Revelation 13.2 says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the... Who, folks? Yeah, it says the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Now, that's interesting. God says it is the dragon that gave this beast its power, its seat there in Rome, and its great authority. So the next obvious question is, who is the dragon? And the answer is going to shock you. Let's go back one chapter. Revelation 12, beginning in verse 7, the Bible tells us. Revelation 12 now and verse 7. That's easy to find. The Bible goes on here and says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. You say, what in the world is God saying that the dragon is the devil and Satan himself? That's strong language for God. Is God then saying that the dragon, the devil, and Satan is the one that's behind this beast power and this kingdom? How can that be? Well, folks, to understand that we've got to get the bigger picture. Please notice something else again in verse 9. It says, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which does what, folks? All right, deceives the whole world. I want you to take that little sentence and just memorize it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you forget everything I tell you in this seminar, don't forget this. The devil has one great work, and that is he wants to deceive the entire world. He wants to deceive you. He wants to deceive everybody. That is Satan's master plan, is to deceive the whole world. Keep that tucked back there, because you're going to see that come out over and over again as we go through this prophetic study tonight. Now, let's get the background here. How could the devil deceive the whole world? In fact, let me ask you a key question. At what point in earth's history did the devil deceive the whole world? He's obviously not doing it tonight. There's lots of preachers exposing the works of the devil and so on. But at what point in earth's history did the devil deceive the entire world? Can anybody here tell me? Okay, you got Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That is exactly right. Now let's get a little bit of history here. You'll find out the Bible says there was a war in heaven. Let me tell you what happened there, and in a future night we'll talk more about this. The Bible tells us that God created Lucifer as the highest of all angels next to the throne of God. We're going to study this in a future night. And Lucifer, we don't know how many eons of time may have gone by that he served God there at the throne faithfully as the highest created angel. But there came a time, the Bible says, that sin was found in him. He became jealous. He wanted to own the throne of God and take it over and so on. And sin and rebellion broke out in heaven. 
Lucifer was leading the way. His influence was spread across heaven to all the angels and so on. And as the Bible says, there was literally a war in heaven. Good against evil, God against Lucifer and so on. And finally God had to cast Satan and one third of the angels that followed him, he had to cast them out of heaven down to this earth. In uh, Friday night's message, I'll explain why all that happened. But that's what happened here, this war in heaven that we're talking about. When Satan and his angels were cast down to this earth, God gave the devil dominion of this planet. This was his place to run his program and run his show and so on. And when he did that, he put Adam and Eve down here. He put the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Remember that? And God told Adam and Eve, don't go near this tree. Don't touch it and don't eat the fruit of it and so on. And yet Adam and Eve did so, and the devil deceived them. Remember how the serpent deceived the woman, and then Adam was next, and so on? And as soon as that happened, when the devil deceived the whole world that was there, Adam and Eve, our parents fell into sin, then, folks, God made the first prophecy in the Bible. I want you to see it in Genesis chapter 3, because it is so powerful and it's so dynamic. In order to really get a picture here of how the dragon is behind this whole thing, how God says the dragon is behind the beast, we've got to get the big picture tonight. And here's where we go. Genesis chapter 3, it's a very short verse, but it is the most powerful prophecy, I believe, in the entire Bible. Let's look at it. Genesis 3, verse 15. In fact, this is the first prophecy you will actually find in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The Bible says, as God speaks to Satan, he says, and I will put enmity between thee and who else? All right, the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his head. Heal. Now you say, what in the world is that talking about? Folks, that is a prophecy that has ramifications clear to the end of time. Notice the two sides. First of all, God says, I'm going to put enmity between thee, which is Satan here, and the woman. Now, when God speaks prophetically, what does a woman represent or symbolize? Can anybody here tell me? All right, the church or God's people, God's side. All through the Bible, Christ is the bridegroom. His people are his bride. He says, I've likened you to a comely and a delicate woman. He says, when we come to him and where sins are forgiven, he says, we're pure virgins as if we've never sinned and so on. So all through the Bible, God uses this beautiful picture of a pure woman to represent his church or his people. So he's basically saying, Satan, from now on, there's two sides. There's you over here, the dragon Satan, and there's the pure woman representing my side. Then he goes on to say something very significant I don't want you to miss. He says the woman someday is going to bring forth her seed. But as soon as he says that, he brings out another prophecy. And don't miss it. He says, Satan, someday also you're going to bring forth your seed. Keep that deep in your mind for just a minute. Tremendous prophecy. Then God goes a step farther. He says the seed of the woman, whoever that's going to be, we'll find out in a minute, he's only going to get a bruised heel. That's just a temporary wound. won't last long. But the seed that the dragon brings forth, whoever that is, we'll discover in a minute, he's going to get a bruised head. That's a permanent death blow to the head. So God was basically saying, Satan, from now on, there's two sides, either my side or your side. And folks, ever since God spoke those words, Everybody that has ever lived has either been on Satan, the dragon's side, or they've been on God's side. Every one of you sitting here tonight, you're either on Satan's side or you're on God's side. Everybody in Walla Walla, everybody in the state of Washington, everybody in the whole world is either on God's side tonight or they're on the dragon's side. And that's very, very powerful when you stop and think about it. Now, I want to take you through a little walk through history from this point on to really get the big picture here. First of all, you're going to find out that these two sides were immediately apparent in the first two kids born on this earth. What were their names? Very good. Cain and Abel. And the story is so revealing. God spoke his word. And when God speaks, folks, his word is clear. Can you say amen? No guessing, no compromising. It's crystal clear. God said to atone for sin, you've got to sacrifice a little lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Abel, who obeyed the voice of God and the word of God, he did it, and God accepted his sacrifice. Cain, his brother, however, said, man, that's gross. I don't want to have no bleeding lamb on an altar. That's, that's terrible. Instead, I'm going to offer God some fruits and vegetables. And he offered God fruits and vegetables, and God rejected Cain's offering. He accepted Abel's offering. Cain got so mad, he came and killed his brother Abel. I got to pause here, folks. The devil's side can always, always, always be identified because it will counterfeit or substitute the word of God. Can you say amen? What's the devil's master plan we just read in the book of Revelation? He goes out to do what? 
That's right, deceive the whole world. The devil has one passion, and that is to deceive you or to counterfeit whatever God says. And by the way, the most amazing thing is whatever the devil counterfeits, it usually makes sense. Have you noticed that? It usually makes more sense than what God says. Think about it. Think, you know, a poor little lamb here bleeding on an altar, being burned in a sacrifice. That's terrible. Well, it's sure a whole lot nicer. It makes a whole lot more sense to offer some fruits and vegetables, doesn't it? But the point here is when God speaks his word, it's the truth. And you never compromise the word of God. But the devil always does it. He always counterfeits the word of God. He always changes the word of God. He always comes up with something different. That's how you track the devil. You can immediately tell if it's a counterfeit simply because he always counterfeits and substitutes the word of God. All right, here's what happens then. Cain's descendants, we're going to take a walk through history, a fascinating walk. Cain's descendants then go out and corrupt this earth with evil and wickedness. They're all on the Satan's and the dragon's side. And finally, this earth has an estimated two to three billion people on it. We don't know for sure, but the scholars estimate that. And out of those two or three billion people, you know what? They're all on Satan the dragon's side except eight, Noah and his family. And the devil was getting excited. He said, man, this is it. I've deceived everybody. I got everybody following sin. Nobody's following the God of heaven. I got the whole world in my hands. And if I can get Noah and his family, then I'll have everybody in the world. And folks, that's why he tried so hard to destroy Noah and his family, because if he had done that, then that prophecy would never come to pass. The seed of the woman would never come. You see, when the devil heard that prophecy, he began to shake in his boots because he knew who the seed of the woman was going to be someday. I'll tell you in just a minute. But that just got him shaking in his boots. And so he wanted to do everything he could to destroy it. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, God himself had to intervene in human history and get Noah to build an ark, get his family of eight individuals in there, and God sent a flood of water, and literally, folks, he destroyed every man and woman on this earth and preserved the eight. You know why? He had to preserve the prophecy. He had to preserve the seed of the woman coming forth someday. That's why God himself intervened in that, because the devil almost triumphed. And then, folks, amazingly, after the flood, you know what? We see the two sides come out again. And they begin to build a tower, the side of evil. Remember this? It was called the Tower of what? Babel. That's exactly right. This is where God confused their language. In defiance against God, they built this big old tower up to the sky. And in case there was a flood again, they could escape and so on. And God confused their language, scattered them all over the earth. But it was here that the devil said, all right, I'm going to beat God at his own game. I'm going to create my own system of worship. And you know what happened? At the site of the Tower of Babel, the devil set up his headquarters. He set it up in a kingdom called Babylon. Babylon is what it really is. In other words, that first world kingdom we've been studying here night by night, the last couple of nights, Babylon, that was set up at the site of the old Tower of Babel. And there the devil decided, I'm going to set up a system of worship here that I can deceive every living person around the entire earth that's been scattered there after the languages were confused. And so he set up a system of worship that revolved around the planetary gods, the worship of the sun and the moon and the stars. And this system of false worship began to be spread to the whole world. And ladies and gentlemen, tonight, you can go to any country of this world you want. I don't care if it's the Maya Indians in Mexico. I don't care if you go to the Far East countries or the Asian countries. I don't care if you go to Africa. I don't care if you go to uh, Ab Aborigines in Australia. You can go anywhere in this world, and you'll find every one of them have a religious, that has a religious system that has its roots back in Babylon. Idolatry began in Babylon. You'll find out that all false practices began in Babylon. Astrology was born in Babylon. Reincarnation began in Babylon. Every pagan practice, the occult, all false worship, everything that's false and contrary to this Bible has its roots in Babylon and you can trace every world religion right back to Babylon. It's amazing. I've done a study of it uh, for years now and I don't care where you go on this earth, you'll find the common threads and they all have the roots in Babylon. And the devil decided if I can get this system of false worship spread to the whole world, then I can get the whole world deceived again and nobody will be following God. And so folks, Babylon is a great world empire, spread its influence. But next on the scene was Medo-Persia. And I want to ask you a question. Whose side was Medo-Persia on? Was it on God's side or the dragon's side? Definitely the dragon's side, yeah. Medo-Persia continued to take these teachings and spread them all over the world. More false worship, more false practices, more idolatry, more paganism. It spread everywhere under Medo-Persia. Next was Greece, the great world empire of Greece under Alexander. Tell me, whose side was Greece on? Definitely God's or the dragon's? 
Definitely the dragon side. If you've studied Greek mythology, they had thousands of false gods. They had thousands of planetary gods they worshipped, from Venus to whoever else. And folks, this system just went everywhere. In fact, today, the Greek influence, the Hellenistic influence, is still prevalent everywhere in the world in many false worship systems. It was powerful. Last of all comes Rome on the scene. And obviously, whose side was Rome's on? God or the dragons? Definitely the dragons. Jesus died on a Roman cross. Roman was deep, or Rome was deep into solar worship and, and all the solar gods and all the gods of, of the emperors and so on. This whole system was everywhere as Rome ruled the world. And my friends, the devil got excited. Because by the time you get to the days of Rome, you've got God's chosen people. They're called the Israelites, the Jewish nation. They're God's very chosen people, and they have in their hands the very Bible that you're holding tonight, the Old Testament portion of it. And that Old Testament portion taught them the truth of God's word. But the people of that day in Rome, God's chosen people, they were so mesmerized by the system of Babylon, they were so entrenched in traditions of men, they were so deceived by false teachings and idolatry and pagan practices, that even having the Bible in their hands, they were not following what the Word of God said. And the devil was elated. He says, man, I've done it. I've got the whole world deceived. I don't care if it's Asia. I don't care if it's Africa. I don't care if it's clear down in Australia. I don't care if it's with the Maya Indians in Mexico. I've got everybody deceived. I've got them all under my control. He said, look at God's people. Here's the chosen people, the Jews. They even have the Bible. Bible, and they're not doing what the Bible says. I've done it. I've deceived the whole world. He was so happy. He was just dancing a jig with joy. But there was something he forgot. And that was this little old prophecy sitting back here in Genesis. Someday there was going to be the seed of the woman. And my friends, at earth's darkest hour, when it seemed that the devil had literally triumphed over God, when it seemed that no one in the whole world was following the Bible or the truth of God anymore, God's great prophetic time clock struck the hour. And it was time for this little prophecy in Genesis to be fulfilled. It was time for the seed of the woman to come forth. Do you want to see it? Word for word. Revelation 12. Let's go there. This is pure dynamite. Revelation chapter 12. Here's how it happens. And you're going to see a perfect fulfillment that we read in Genesis. Here's the perfect fulfillment in Revelation chapter 12. All those years later, it finally happened. Revelation 12 verse 1. Here is the woman now. It says in Revelation 12 verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown, of 12 stars. So follow this carefully. That woman predicted all the way back in Genesis, she finally appears here in the book of Revelation. She's come forth. All right. Now, this is interesting. Who does the woman symbolize again? All right, God's people, the church. You're going to find out that specifically it refers to Mary, the Blessed Virgin, the mother of Jesus Christ. However, Mary in her purity symbolizes all God's people who also follow Jesus and are cleansed from their sins. So primarily it means Mary, but symbolically it represents all God's people who have been cleansed of sin and saved by His grace. So, let's go on. It goes in verse 2 and says, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now, folks, this is amazing. Next question is, who is this great red dragon? We read it already tonight. Who's the dragon? That's Satan. All right, so what we got here is Satan the dragon... And he wants to devour this man-child that the woman brings forth as soon as she brings him forth. But notice something else interesting. Satan the dragon is pictured here with seven heads and ten horns. Now we know what the ten horns is. We already discussed that. But what do the seven heads on Satan the dragon represent? The answer is going to blow your mind. Turn ahead a couple of pages. Keep your finger here. But turn to Revelation 17 verse 9. Revelation chapter 17 verse 9. The Bible interprets it for you. Revelation chapter 17 verse 9. This is exciting. Mark it carefully. Revelation 17 verse 9. The Bible says, and here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven what? 
Hmm, seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you tell me what place on earth is known as the city of seven mountains or seven hills. Where is that? That's Rome. You look it up in your encyclopedia tonight, the first thing it's going to say is Rome, city of seven hills. By the way, I've been there many, many times. You can stand on the great Colosseum and look out, and on a bronze plaque up there, it'll point out the seven hills of Rome. Their names are Palatine, Capitoline, Quirinal, Vilmanel, Esquiline, Callian, and Avantine. Those are the seven hills that Rome is built on. And so what do we have here? Let's go back to the prophecy in uh, Revelation chapter 12. The woman brings forth a man-child that is caught up to God and to his throne. Folks, who is the man-child? Who's the only child that's ever been born that has been caught up to God's throne? Who is that? That's Jesus Christ, exactly. Now, can you see why the devil was so scared for this prophecy to take place? Jesus Christ had kicked him out of heaven years before this. Jesus Christ had kicked the devil and one-third of the angels out of heaven, down to this earth. He'd already won the battle once. And when the devil heard that prophecy back in Genesis, that someday the woman would bring forth her seed, the devil was scared to death because now Jesus was coming down to the devil's turf and Jesus was going to play with the devil on his own grounds and whoop him big time. Amen. Made the devil just tremble when he thought about that. That's why he did everything he could to stop it. And think about it. What do you got the picture here? You got Satan the dragon with seven heads representing the seven hills of Rome. That means Satan working through Rome to kill that man child as soon as he's born. And isn't that exactly what happened? It was the devil Satan that inspired Herod who was working for the Romans. Killed every child two years and under. Get rid of this baby. But ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was marvelously protected. Amen. His parents fled down to Egypt. And then they came back after it was safe. He grew up in a little backwoods town called Nazareth. I've been there many times. Beautiful little city up on the mountain there in Israel. And Jesus grew up there in the carpenter's shop. And finally, at about age 30, Jesus began his ministry. I tell you, the devil was so mad. He was so mad. The seed of the woman had come. And you know what Jesus did? He began to preach the truth. Oh, the devil hated that. The devil hates truth because he knows the truth is what sets people free. And Jesus began to preach the word. In fact, do you know that 86% of the words of Jesus in the New Testament are quoted straight out of the Old Testament? If there was ever a Bible preacher, it was Jesus Christ. And everything that the devil had deceived the people with, Jesus came with the authority of his word and blew it away. Every deception, Jesus came with the Bible and showed the truth. Every lie of Satan, Jesus preached the truth and blew it away. Every piece of idolatry, Jesus blew it away. All the deceptions of the devil, Jesus, through the authority of his word, he blew it all back to hell where it came from. And the devil got so mad, he said, we've got to shut this guy up. He inspired the Pharisees. Try to stone him. And they tried to stone Jesus. Jesus said, my hour's not yet come. Went on his way, you know. They tried to throw him over a cliff one time. Jesus said, my hour's not yet come. Can't do it. And that voice went on to preach the truth. Jesus gathered 12 disciples around him. He taught them the truth. And folks, after he had took the truth and got it back to the people, after he had uncovered all of Satan's lies and all of Satan's deceptions and shown all of the error and shown that light of truth when it was bright and crystal clear, then Jesus said, I have accomplished my mission. And he went to the old rugged cross and there he died and paid your death penalty on the cross of Calvary. He gave you free grace that you might be saved forever. And folks, when he did that, they stuck him in the tomb. Thank God he died for us. Can you say amen? shed his blood for our sins, conquered death. Praise God for that tonight. We're going to talk more about that on Thursday. And folks, when he went into that tomb, do you remember what the prophecy said about this? It said that the woman's seed was going to get a what? A bruised heel, just a temporary wound. The devil thought, I got him. Shut that voice up. I'm so sick of him. Everything I've done, he's undermined. Everything I've worked for all these years, Jesus has completely blown it out of the water now. He was so glad when Jesus went in that tomb. He said, shut him up. Never let him out of there. Seal that thing. Get the old Roman soldiers. All the devil and his imps were down there, folks. And finally, on the third day, the devil was really shaking because he knew the prophecy. And on that third day, Jesus bushed out of that tomb and said, I'm here. Come on and say amen. I'm alive forevermore. I was dead, but now I hold the keys not only of hell, but of death. And I'll tell you, folks, the devil was mad. He was so mad. Jesus stayed another 40 days, told his disciples, I want you all to tarry here in Jerusalem till the power of my Holy Spirit comes upon you. And when that happens, go out to all the world and let them know the truth and the good news of salvation. And those disciples tarried and they prayed until the day of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost came, folks, the Holy Spirit's power came down and they went out equipped with the gifts of the Spirit and that church was energized and on fire and on power for God and they went out and conquered the world for Jesus Christ. I long to see the Pentecostal power come back in the church today. 
Can you say amen? And I'll tell you, folks, when that happened, the devil didn't know what to do. He was so mad. He said, I had the whole world deceived. And now all these disciples are going out and preaching the truth. Jesus, the seed of the woman has come. He's unmasked all my deceptions. He didn't know what to do. He said, I got to stop him. He did everything he could to stop. He couldn't stop him. They just went out like wildfire. Paul went right up the gates of old heathen Rome and raised up Christian churches. The devil said, I'll persecute him. I'll put him to death. And so he inspired Nero and all those emperors and all those people. And he got them together and they started to kill the Christians. They started to martyr them by the thousands and thousands. But the devil figured out after a few weeks, the more I kill them, the more they're inspired to grow and every time I kill one martyr 20 more come up to take his place that isn't working folks the more he persecuted the more the church grew I can't wait for persecution again amen get rid of all the dead wood and let the stars shine praise God I mean a glorious day when all the pew warmers are gone out of church amen God's spirit is poured out I long for that day I really do but you know folks the devil finally said what am I gonna do I've tried deception it doesn't work anymore Jesus Christ came to the seat of the woman and blew everything away. Now the disciples are going all over the world. Christians are popping up. I try to persecute him. It doesn't work anymore. What am I going to do? He was so mad. He finally went back in his workshop and he began to think, what am I going to do? Deception doesn't work anymore. Can't persecute him anymore. <sighs> all those years of work down the drain. What am I going to do? And he went back and forth in his little shop there trying to figure out how to do it. All of a sudden, one day, it dawned on him. I think I'll try strategy. Hmm. Hmm. If you can't fight them, join them. Why didn't I think of this before? Why don't I create my own super universal church? Are you listening? And if I could create my own super universal church and base it on the same errors and idolatry and false worship of Babylon, only put a real pretty Christian veneer over it, you know what? I could deceive the whole world, and not only that, I could do it all in the name of the Lord. Man alive, I've been beating my head against the wall. This has been stupid. I'm going to join the church. I'm going to create a super church. And so, folks, the devil got smart. He decided to combine Christian and pagan things together. And through this, get as many people as he could to go to church, but just make sure that they were following errors and false teachings all in the name of God. Isn't that a master plan? Hey, folks, you talk about a master plan. That's a master plan. Incredible. And that's exactly what happened. So follow this carefully now. The prophecy, and this is the part you can't miss. The prophecy said in Genesis that the woman would bring forth her seed. Who was the seed of the woman, folks? Jesus Christ. As soon as the woman brought forth her seed in Revelation 12, what happens immediately next? Chapter 13, God said also the devil would bring forth his seed correct? The seed of Satan comes forth in the very next chapter as the beast of Revelation chapter 13, the Antichrist kingdom. Just like Jesus came and established his kingdom on this earth and in our hearts, the devil was forced to fulfill the second part of the prophecy. He had to bring forth his seed, and now we've got a counterfeit kingdom called the Antichrist kingdom on this earth. Revelation 12, the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ. Revelation 13, next chapter, the seed of Satan, the Antichrist kingdom. Now, folks, with that background, let's go back to our question and answer period tonight. Does it make sense now why all the Bible writers said that the spirit of Antichrist and the kingdom of Antichrist was already working even back in their day? Does that make sense now? 
Does it make sense now that Antichrist is not one person who's suddenly going to appear at the end of time? But can you see now why all the Bible writers said it was already working in their day? It's, it's, it's so simple. As soon as Jesus Christ came, Satan had to counterfeit it and come up with Antichrist. And that's what the whole controversy in the book of Revelation is all about. Satan combined Christian and pagan things together, came up with a system, and came up with a thing that could uh, deceive the whole world. Now this is also why you're going to see something else interesting. Look again, folks, at the beast of Revelation 13. Notice that this beast, representing this papal Roman kingdom, it's made up, do you notice, of those four beasts in Daniel? Look at it carefully. First of all, it has the heads of the lion, which was the kingdom of Babylon. That means the head of this kingdom is actually based on Babylon and its false teachings and practices. Secondly, it has the feet of the bear, which is Medo-Persia. That means what it moves in its messages, and, and, and the way it uh, the messages go around the world, is from Medo-Persia. The third thing it has is the body of the leopard, which was Greece. That means the core of this entire system is based on Greek philosophy, Greek idolatry, Greek mysticism, Greek false teachings, all the things that the Greek influence brought in. And last of all, it has the ten horns from Rome. Rome was deep into solar worship. It was deep into this whole system of idolatry and pagan practices. God represents this beast kingdom of papal Rome as actually being made up and composited of these four pagan kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, because when it was formed, it actually literally drew its doctrines and its beliefs and its teachings and its practices from these four pagan empires, then mixed it with Christianity and came up with this counterfeit system. Isn't that a master plan? It just blows your mind when you think about it. Now you may say, Leo, can you illustrate that for us? That, that just seems so dramatic. Can you illustrate that? I'd like to do that tonight with two neutral illustrations. Can I pick those tonight? Two that everybody here is going to be very, very comfortable with. And uh, just to illustrate, what I want you to really see is why God is showing this beast kingdom as being made up of these four pagan kingdoms and because it drew everything from them. I want to take a couple examples you'll all be comfortable with. The first one is something we've all just celebrated a few weeks ago. What was it called? Christmas. Very good. Now, let me say something here. My issue is not to talk about Christmas, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, the Bible doesn't talk about Christmas. Uh, that came many years afterward and so on. But... What I want to illustrate here is how something can come from Babylon into our world and get Christianized, and we call it Christmas. Now, almost all churches today celebrate the birthday of Jesus as December the 25th. Isn't that right? That's why we have Christmas season and the nativity scene and all these different things. And again, I'm not saying Christmas is right. I'm not saying it's wrong. That's up to your conscience. There are some beautiful things about Christmas, isn't there, folks? Christmas is a time of giving. Is that biblical? Sure. Christmas is a time of family. Is that biblical? Sure. Christmas is a time when people go in debt and get drunk. Is that biblical? No. So, you know, you use principles here. There's a lot of beautiful things about Christmas, but of course, if it violates a Bible principle, then you want to be careful in, in certain areas. So my issue isn't whether Christmas is right or wrong, but I want to use this as an illustration. Have you ever wondered, where in the world did we get Christmas in the Christian community? And that everybody around the world celebrates the birthday of Jesus, based, uh, as far as Christians, on December 25th? By the way, we know for sure December 25th cannot be the birthday of Jesus. The reason is the Bible tells us the shepherds were in the fields, and they're not in the fields at that time of year. That, that's cold. It snows in Jerusalem and so on. And uh, most likely, scholars agree that Jesus was born in the month of October. We don't know for sure, but most likely. But for sure, he was not born December 25th. So have you ever wondered, did the thought ever cross your mind, where did we get December 25th as the birthday of Jesus? Ever wonder about that? I'd like to tell you where it comes from. Go all the way back to the kingdom of Babylon. You're going to find everything goes back to Babylon, okay? In Babylon, they worshipped the solar system, as I mentioned earlier, and the supreme god of the universe they worshipped was the sun god. Would you like to read that in your Bible? Turn back to Ezekiel. I'll tell you how to get there. You all know where Daniel is? The book just before Daniel is the book Ezekiel. And if you'll turn back to Ezekiel for a minute, we want to go here to chapter 8 for a moment. Ezekiel chapter 8, and let's look together at verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 14. That should be easy for you to find just before the book of Daniel. You all know where Daniel is now. And in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14, this was written, by the way, in the time of uh, Babylon. And uh, there's a lot of things about Babylon in this book. So look what happens here in verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 14. All right, here we go. It says, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now I want to pause here. Tammuz, you're going to find out in a future night, was the son of of the sun god that they worshipped. I'll show you that in the slides on the night we talk about the mark of the beast. That's later. All right, let's go on. Verse 15. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. 
And verse 16, he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, their faces toward the east, and they worship the what, folks? Yeah, they worship the sun toward the east. Now, sun worship was the primary form of worship back in Babylon. They always worshiped the sun. Now, here's what happened, and you all can really relate to this. You'll find out in their pagan minds, they did not understand the solar system as we do today, back there in the days of Babylon. They didn't understand our world working like it does. And uh, so what they noticed was, as the year came toward the month of December, the days were getting shorter and shorter. You all notice that too, don't you? And in their pagan minds, not knowing how the universe worked, they thought their sun god, the one they loved so much, was mad at them. And it was going away. You know why? Because every day he shone a little bit less. And the next day he shone a little bit less. And the next day he shone a little bit less. And they got to thinking, you know, if the sun keeps shining a little bit less today, and a little bit less tomorrow, a little bit less the next day, pretty soon he's not going to shine at all. He's going to be gone. And if he's gone, we're going to have no light. And we're all going to die. So the pagan priest created a teaching. And they said basically this. We have to offer sacrifices to the sun god. Now, folks, what's the shortest day of the year? Does anybody know the winter solstice? December 22nd, actually. December 22nd. Now, that's the shortest day of the year. December 23rd is the same. December 24th, the day begins to get a little bit longer, but back then they couldn't quite detect it. However, on December 25th, they could detect that the day was getting a little bit longer. So you know what they did? They began to hold sacrifices to the pagan sun god on December 22nd, the shortest day of the year. They do it on December 23rd. Then on December 24th, they would offer the supreme sacrifice to the pagan sun god. They would literally put a man on an altar that was carefully selected. They would plunge a knife into him, rip out his heart while it was still beating, put it on a golden platter and hold it up to the sun god while it still was beating to appease the sun god and say, sun god, hear our prayer. Come back. Don't leave us. Come shine on us for another year. And the priest would do that with all all the people there. Then the next day, December 25th, they would go out and tell the people, the sun god has spoken to us as his priest. He's going to come back and shine on us for another year. And guess what? It happened. <laughs> Isn't that something? You know, the days would start to get longer, the sun would come back, and everybody would get happy. The priests were right. And this is, this is what they taught the people and so on. And next year, they'd come to December 24th again, give the ultimate sacrifice. December 25th, the sun has returned. He's heard our prayers. It became the birthday of the sun the sun god in the sky. That's where it comes from. Now this pagan practice went right from Babylon into Medo-Persia. From Medo-Persia it went straight into Greece. Greece is really heavy into it by the way. From Greece it went straight into Rome. And even Rome today folks, we are styled after Rome. Our calendar comes from Rome, right? What do we call the first day of the week? Sunday, named after the sun. What do we call the seventh day of the week? Saturday, that's named after Saturn. What do we call Monday? What we call Monday is <laughs> after the moon. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Well, all of our days of our week are named after the solar system. So they were very big into it. And here's what happens, and don't miss this transition. This is most important. Pagan Rome, with all these things, has this birthday of the sun, December 25th. And they practiced it all over. You come about 300 years after Jesus to a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine. Ever heard of him before? Constantine claimed to become the first Christian emperor in Rome. He really wasn't a Christian, but uh, he claimed to become one. It's kind of a political move like our candidates do today. And, uh, you know, when they go to the church, then they say, I'm a born-again Christian. When they go to the homosexuals, they say, I'm gay. And when they go to the women's rights movements over here, they say, I believe in abortion. And when they go back to church, they say, no, I'm against abortion. You know, that's, that's kind of the way Constantine was. And uh, the kingdom was growing with Christians so much and it was growing with pagans, you know, basically they were balancing each other out, but the Christians were a little bit stronger at this point, so he decided to become one of them. And as a political move, he decided he had to change some events. It came to the birthday of the sun god. And he had all these pagans worshiping the sun god on December 25th, the birthday of the sun, and he had all these Christians over here that he wanted to appease, and he got smart. He says, Christians, I got a great idea. You know all these pagans over here worshiping December 25th, the birthday of the sun? Why don't we take that pagan holiday and why don't we make it the birthday of the Son of God, Jesus Christ? And we could win all these pagans to Christianity if we began to celebrate December 25th as the birthday of Jesus Christ. And the pagans said, you know, the Christians said, that, that's a great idea, wonderful idea, why don't we do that? And so, folks, he did it. You take a little bit of time after that as Constantine turns it into a Christian empire, a couple hundred years later, it turns from pagan Rome totally into papal Rome. The transition is made. And when papal Rome comes to the throne, 
a pope a few years later says, hey, this is a great idea. We're going to make this official Christian doctrine. And so he Christianized December 25th, calls it the birthday of Jesus, and Rome, papal Rome, then rules the world for the next 1260 years, and it passes this teaching to the whole world, and everybody celebrates December 25th as the birthday of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Now again, folks, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Christmas. When it comes to an issue like this, uh, I think there's many wonderful things we can enjoy about Christmas that are biblical. There are some things that I think we have to be careful of, but Christmas is a wonderful holiday, and the Bible doesn't say to do it, doesn't say not to do it. It's up to your conscience. Are you clear on that tonight? I just use this for an illustration to show how something can come from Babylon, make its way into the beast's power, get Christianized, and then get spread to the whole world, and everybody does it, and nobody thinks twice about it. Isn't that amazing? Let me give you another illustration. This will really tweak you. Something we're going to celebrate here pretty quick. Another holiday that all Christians enjoy. What is it called? Easter. Very, very good. All right. Now, where in the world did we ever get Easter to celebrate Jesus' resurrection? Have you ever wondered about that? I bet most of you have never thought about it twice. You know why? Because everybody's always done it. Your mommy and daddy did it. Their parents did it. Grandma and grandpa did it. Great grandparents did it. You do it because everybody else has done it all your life. You just kind of go along because everybody else has done it, right? All right. But where did it come from? Did the thought ever cross your mind? First of all, let me make a statement here that's going to blow your mind. Do you know that Easter Sunday cannot possibly be the day of the resurrection? You know why? Easter never falls on the same date year to year, right? It can't be the day of Jesus' resurrection. I'll tell you why. Look at the screen here. For example, Let's go back five or six years. In 1996, Easter came on April the 7th. That's when you all celebrated it. The next year, 1997, it came on March the 30th. Hmm. The next year, 1998, it came on April the 12th. Last year, it came on April the 3rd. This year, it's going to come on April the 23rd. So how can you have a difference from April the 23rd clear back to March 30th? That's a difference of 23 days. How does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. Easter is not regulated by a date. Easter is regulated by the solar system. You know why? Easter always comes the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the equinox, when days and nights are equal length. You never knew that, did you? Isn't that amazing? And so all the people that are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday morning, it's just not true. It didn't happen then. <laughs> okay? Now, I know that blows your mind. Now, again, let me, let me say something. Folks, my issue here is not whether Easter is right or wrong. Are you all clear on that? Uh, I think it's wonderful that we celebrate Jesus' resurrection once a year. The Bible doesn't say to do it, doesn't say not to do it. And there's some beautiful things about celebrating Jesus' res resurrection. And by the way, it was in the springtime. Jesus was, was actually crucified at Passover. Passover is what we should be celebrating and so on. And then the day, three days afterward, the days which was called the day of the uh, way sheep offering, that's when we should actually celebrate it. But anyway, the question is, how did we ever get Easter on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox? Did you ever wonder about that? I'll tell you where it comes from. Would you like to guess? comes from Babylon, you're right. Everything goes back to Babylon, I don't care what it is. In Babylon, they had a goddess of fertility. Her name was, interestingly, Ishtar. I-S-H-T-A-R. That's where we get our word Easter from, was this pagan goddess of fertility. If you doubt this, by the way, go home tonight in your encyclopedia and look up Easter in your encyclopedia. It'll tell you the whole story that I'm going to tell you right now. It's in every history book. And what they did, this goddess of fertility called Ishtar, they worshipped her in the springtime. You know why? Because everything was coming to life. And she was the one that caused all life and everything to grow anyway. So they thought she got very active in the springtime. So they honored her always on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox. That was Ishtar's day. Because she was the goddess of fertility, the goddess of reproduction. And you know what happens, folks? They took that then, and they celebrated this day of her in her honor. And so did Medo-Persia. And so did Greece. In fact, uh, Greece had her under another name called Venus. You ever heard of Venus before? That's Ishtar in Babylon, the same thing. And then you go to Rome, and Rome had this, and folks, the same thing. You come to Constantine. Constantine, about 300 years after Jesus, says, hey, we got all these pagans out here, and they're worshiping Ishtar on the first Sunday after the first full moon after equinox. You know what? Jesus rose from the tomb in the springtime. It was Passover time and so on. Why don't we take this Ishtar's day, and instead of giving honor to Ishtar, the giver of life and so on, 
Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the life. Why don't we start to keep this day in honor of Jesus Christ? And we could win all these pagans to Christianity. And the Christians said, that's a great idea. And so, folks, he changed Easter's day to Easter day in honor of Jesus' resurrection. And then, as Papal Rome again rules the entire world for the next 1260 years, it passes that teaching on to everybody in the world, and the whole world does it, and nobody even thinks twice about it. But you all tell me, what in the world do chocolate chickies and bunny rabbits got to do with the resurrection of Jesus? Amen? Did you ever wonder about that? I bet you didn't. You know why? You've done it all your life. Everybody does it. But you know where it comes from? Make a guess. Babylon is right. Because folks, in Babylon, they worshipped the egg on Easter's Day. Because an egg is a symbol of fertility. Not only that, they worship bunny rabbits on Easter's Day. You know why? Because bunny rabbits are the most prolific reproducers in the world. I know. I grew up on a ranch. We had lots of rabbits. All rabbits do is make love and have babies. Isn't that right? Yeah. And so, honestly, they worship the rabbit. And we still have that today. All the way back from Babylon. Amazing, isn't it? But now, folks, I want to ask you another question here tonight. I want you to think with me, because you're intelligent people. If things like Christmas and Easter, coming straight from pagan Babylon, have made their way into our world tonight, and been Christianized, and everybody just does it because everybody else does it, my question to you is this. Don't you suppose that there might be some other things also? Don't you suppose there might have been some other false teachings or errors or pagan practices or deceptions that have snuck their way in that we are following and teaching and practicing that's totally contrary to the truth of the Bible? Don't you think there might be some of those? You better believe it, my friends. You better believe it. There are many, many things, not only in our world, but also in our Christian world today, that we believe, that we teach, that we follow, and that we practice. Many things that are totally contrary to this Bible that you're holding in your hands tonight. History is repeating itself. And I'm going to tell you something. If the devil was so successful to deceive everybody at the first coming of Jesus, because they were so entrenched with the false teachings of Babylon at that time, don't you think the devil has redoubled his efforts in these last days? You better believe it, folks. There are many, many things. Many of our teachings in Christianity are totally contrary to the Bible. Many of our practices that we practice in Christianity are totally against the Bible. Many of the things that we believe are totally deceptions that we've accepted and blindly followed without seeing what the Bible says. In fact, folks, there is one great deception. I'm going to make a statement here tonight, and I say this in total honesty as a minister of the gospel. There is one great deception that I can honestly say 95% of everybody in the state of Washington is following the beast and worshiping the beast all the time, and they don't even know it, and they're not even aware of it. 95% minimum of all the people in Washington are deceived and worshiping the beast and following the beast all the time. They don't even know it. And by the way, we're going to get into that next week. I have to cover a couple subjects first, but we're going to get into that next week, and it will literally blow your mind. Let's go to Revelation 18. I want you to see what this is all about. Revelation chapter 18. We're going to get the big picture now, okay? Revelation chapter 18. And the Bible tells us here what the message is all about. Revelation chapter 18, let's look at verse 2. Revelation chapter 18, verse 2 says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now let it notice, God is telling us, hey, the system of Babylon is still here, folks. It's, it's here, it's, it's alive and well. The system of deception and pagan practice, and it's here in the last days. And he says, I want you to know it's a fallen system. Then verse four, 3, he says, For all nations, that means the whole world, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. 
and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. You know what God is saying here? He is saying that the entire world in the last days is drunk with the false teachings of Babylon. Everything is the same as it was at Jesus' first coming. The whole world, he's telling us, is deceived and drunk with Babylon's teachings. That could include you folks. That could include me. We've got to be on our toes. Can you say amen? Like never before. Now when a person is drunk, do they know what they're doing? No. Are they in their right mind when they're drunk? No. Folks, you've got to get out of the drunken stupor. And then what that means is, mommy and daddy did it. I've been doing it all my life. Everybody's doing it. Let's just follow the Pied Piper. We go through this routine like this because everybody's done it. We've done it all our lives. God says we've got to break out of this autopilot. We've got to break, break out of this drunken stupor. And we've got to get into the Word of God and the truth like never before. Can you say amen? There's ever an hour where we've got to be in our Bibles. It's in this final hour of verse history as we stand on the very verge of eternity tonight. Then he goes on and gives his message call. In verse 4 it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Folks, God says, I want you to come out of Babylon. That's the message of Revelation. To come out of Babylon, to come out of false teachings, to come out of error, and to come out of deception, and follow the truth of the Bible.